Uh, this is Dr. Henry Nasrallah, Editor-in-Chief of Current Psychiatry, and with me is a very distinguished scientist and psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Eric Kandel, who is uh, the Nobel Laureate uh, for Medicine and Physiology uh, in the year 2000. We are extremely proud to have a psychiatrist who uh, won the Nobel Prize for major advances in brain research, especially focused on memory and learning. So I'm very happy and privileged to have Dr. Kendall today to just talk to us a little bit about psychiatry, where we were, where we are now, and where we're going. This is a topic that he has written about quite a bit. So Dr. Kendall, thank you very much for agreeing to do this interview. Uh, you have had a distinguished career, but also a, a perspective on psychiatry that very few people have had over the last few decades. Could you tell us a little bit about what psychiatry was like then, now, and where we should be going? Uh, well, the psychiatry, when I entered it, which was as a medical student in the early 1950s, um, was an extremely interesting field, like, very popular with medical students. For example, when I was a resident at the Mass Mental Health Center at Harvard in 1960, one-third of the Harvard Medical School class uh, went into psychiatry for wow. their residency. One-third. And very talented people because it was such a seductive field. Psychoanalysis was the dominant mode of thought, and it is a very attractive view of the human mind. Um, the problem with psychoanalysis was that it was not empirically based, uh, and it made a certain number of promises uh, that it could not keep. For example, at the Harvard Medical School, Greta Biebring, who was a great leader of psychoanalytic thinking at Harvard, chairman of the Department of Psychiatry Beth Israel, convinced the chair people of medicine that psychoanalysis would cure all the problems that medicine was not solving in the 1950s. Now, in the 1950s, we didn't have medicines for most of the major medical ills, ulcerative colitis, uh, asthma, uh, you know, you name it. <laughs> angina, most medical diseases, we, hypertension, we didn't have treatments for. So she thought these were psychosomatic diseases and they would respond to psychoanalysis. And when that failed, there was a major decline in the reputation of psychoanalysis in the 60s and early 70s. And with it, sort of a, a down playing of the importance of psychotherapy. Uh, both of them, I think, were premature. So that, that affected psychiatry as that a discipline? That affected psychiatry as a discipline. It became less popular as a discipline. But it did become more empirical. It became more biologically based. And there was an increased realization that as genetics was coming along, that this would be an important handle. And as imaging came along, we might be able to get some markers for mental illness in the brain. Um, Unfortunately, that has been a very tough road to work. It's a very promising one. It needs to be worked, but it's been very tough. Uh, for example, we have really not identified any pattern of genes as yet uh, in most major illnesses, except knowing that it's a, they're complex genetic disorders. They involve a combination of genes working together and environmental factors as well. But we're making progress. We're making progress, particularly in some areas. Right. Dramatic progress in autism the realization of two major new genetic mechanisms, the NOVA mutation and copy number variations is a spectacular insight. Uh, and we see particularly uh, in autism how important it is. We see, for example, uh, that um, the age of the father is extremely important in autism because there are de novo mutation in the sperm. Yes. And the older the father, the more likely for those de novo mutations. And one of the reasons the incidence of autism may be increasing is because people marry later and fathers are older and therefore more likely to have de novo mutations. But it also has a high concordance rate, you said, in the identical twins. Amazing. 90%. So if one twin has it, 90% is likely to have it. Moreover, it gives us a way of identifying genes that are unique. So if you have a de novo mutation, if the mother does not have the disease, and the father does not have the disease, but the child has the disease, you can sequence the father's genome, sequence the mother's genome, and sequence the child's genome. Right. So the child's genome should, in principle, have representation from both the mother and the father, insofar as there's a difference in the genome of the child 
it is likely to come from that copy from right. that uh, de novo mutation. So we might be able to identify a number of genes right. that put you at risk for autism. So that's a fantastic advance. Exciting. We spoke earlier about Helen Mayberg's work of using imaging to detect a marker for depression, right. area 25, and now we know a whole neural circuit involving amygdala hippocampus that is involved in depression. And you pointed out the shrinkage of the hippocampus in depression. So we are beginning to get clues. Uh, we know about um, the importance of the prefrontal cortex uh, in, in schizophrenia. We know about the fact that pruning may be excessive in schizophrenia. Uh, so there are areas now in which for the first time we're beginning to have really significant biological insights. So I feel very hopeful uh, for the next several decades. And I see young people coming into psychiatry that didn't come into it before. Right. The MD, PhD students that used to come work with me, most of them came from wanted to go into neurology before. Right. Now, they're the last Chris Pittenger, I mean Edgar, have gone into psychiatry. So uh, I feel very encouraged about the future Excellent. of psychiatry. Uh, what do you think about training? What, what should the future psychiatrist uh, training be like? I think psychiatry training ought to be changed completely. I think that the first two years ought to be common training for neurologists and psychiatry. They're looking at the same organ. It's very much like internal medicine, like medicine as a whole. One doesn't become a cardiologist without first having an internship in general right. medicine and a residency in general medicine. And I think this is the way that it should be. They should be thoroughly grounded uh, in, in, um, in the biology of the brain. This is not to say that the character structure of somebody who goes into psychiatry is not different from neurology. What psychiatry has contributed to medicine, which is actually unique, is Freud's insight that one has to listen to the patient carefully. That is, you know, a new way of taking history and empathic involvement of the patient is a psychiatric innovation, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's essential that we maintain that. I also think that psychotherapy is extremely effective, that, you know, people benefit from it daily, and that we ought to study it more thoroughly to understand, you know, what aspects of, psych of psychotherapy are reliable, what aspects of, you know, are arbitrary. Uh, of what kinds of psychotherapy work for what kinds of patients. So there are lots of things that would be very easy to sort of uh, understand about psychotherapy. Uh, Which is a biological treatment, as you call it. Absolutely, right? because it affects brain structure. Of course, yeah. uh, so I think understanding that better. So I think we're heading in a very wonderful phase in psychiatry. Thank you. And you originally went to medical school wanting to be a psychoanalyst, but yes. then you, by the end of your training, you changed your mind and became a basic scientist. What made you do that? Uh, at that time, I didn't do it because I rejected psychoanalysis. I did it because I loved science more. I really liked the pleasure of doing it. Uh, with time, I realized I made a good decision because not only was I enjoying uh, uh, biology uh, of the brain, but biology of the brain was exploding. It was becoming so interesting while psychoanalysis was declining. So when I now meet my friends who are my contemporaries at the Mass Mental Health Center, you know, they have been, I mean, they're wonderful people, very gifted people, as gifted as myself, but they've been part of a tradition that's shrinking while I've been privileged to belong to a tradition that's been expanding. It's, there's nothing more inspiring than to be with a movement that has the illusion it's very successful. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so so the, the expansion and explosion of neuroscience really benefits psychiatry more than anything else. It benefits neurology and psychiatry. And neurology as well. But yeah. we, we get the benefit because we were seen as functional and now we're more and more becoming... It's, it's completely transformed. Uh, yeah. When I was president of the Society of Neuroscience in 1980, we had a program committee that planned symposia. And my friend Jimmy Schwartz, who like me is very friendly to psychoanalysis, suggested to the symposium committee uh -huh. that they have a symposium on psychoanalysis. Oh. In the middle of the neuroscience program. Yes. And it was voted down. And on the way out, Joseph Coyle 
said to me, Jimmy was pulling our leg. He wasn't serious about that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that he was not pulling anybody's leg. I was not pulling anybody's leg. We were interested in having it was premature. Absolutely. Now I think if you suggested something like this, there's a better chance. Yeah, well, Dr. Kendall, thank you so much for pleasure. speaking with us today. Absolute we are pleasure. honored to have you with us today. And Very thanks nice to the listeners and, and to the readers of Current Psychiatry. Thank you.